Let's get more now on that speech we are expecting in just a few minutes' time from President Trump on the Iran nuclear deal, which was championed by Barack Obama during his time in office. Uh, Donald Trump has repeatedly criticised this agreement. According to his Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, he will set out a tough new approach to relations between the two countries. Joining us to discuss the implications of the President's decision are James Soreen, Chief Executive of the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Centre, and from Washington, Republican strategist James Norton. Thank you very much both for your time. James Soreen, if I can start with you, why does the President want out of this deal? Well, I think there's two main considerations. Number one is domestically, uh, this was Obama's deal, this was Obama's diplomatic triumph. And in Trump's kind of worldview, the deal represents everything wrong with American foreign policy. He believed it was weak, he believed it was soft on terrorism, uh, and really was kind of, you know, the US departing from, from trouble spots around the world. But in his view, he believes that the deal doesn't do enough to deal with uh, Iran's aggression in the region. Uh, its ballistic uh, missile program, which is capable of carrying nuclear warheads, and also its support of Hezbollah and other Shia militias in the region that have been carrying out atrocities, for instance, in Syria. The accusations of the lifting of sanctions, James Norton, giving Iran the ability to expose, uh, sorry, export terrorism across the region, is that a fair one? You know, I think that uh, this is probably going to be one of the most important decisions that President Trump has made at this point in his uh, 10 months as president. And so I think, you know, it's critical that uh, he comes across with a clear, concise message in terms of what exactly he wants to occur, because obviously we're, you know, have the issue with North Korea, we have the issue with the Russians, we have the issues in other parts of the world. And I think that, you know, this is a big challenge for him and for him to be able to come across that this is what he wants to have happen. He was contradicted earlier this week or last week by Secretary James Mattis of the Defense Department supporting the deal and wanting to have you know things in place and so I think that this is this is kind of a uh, an eggshell type situation for the president where he really needs to have his staff supporting his position and then he needs to be very clear to the world in terms of how he's gonna uh, James, work with the Iranians. James Serene talking about his staff um, like James Norton was there um, I mean he could just rip this deal up couldn't he so he's listening to the people around him because he's clearly not just deciding to tear it up and walk away. Well, he can't actually rip it up. I mean, it's an international agreement that involves the uh, uh, permanent five members of the Security Council uh, plus Germany. I think the thing that really riles Trump uh, is he knows that he can harm it uh, by putting it in jeopardy, he can create uncertainty, uh, he can increase sanctions, but he can't actually kill the deal himself. And that's probably why what he's doing is a halfway house. He's doing what he likes doing. It's typical Trump. He's going to make a big splash. Uh, he's going to talk about Iran's violation of the deal without any real evidence of it. Uh, and then he's really going to kick it back over to Congress and say, look, you need to sort this out and you need to toughen up this deal and you need to ramp up sanctions. But I mean, I have to say the position that seems to be emerging, it doesn't really seem seem to be particularly coherent, and, and it's likely that uh, a Congress is not going uh, to be able to pass uh, a kind of toughened up version of this or uh, putting on uh, uh, additions to the deal. I mean, let's be clear, the deal is not perfect. Uh, there are problems with it, and it never dealt with really what happens at the end of the deal's expiry after 10, 15 years, when Iran can just start its program up again. It has problems around inspection by the IAEA. A lot of people say it isn't tough enough. But what is interesting is that a country like Israel, which probably has a, a, the most to fear from Iran uh, and Iran's commitment to Israel's destruction, that the uh, military and security establishment in Israel have kind of made their peace with it. And they kind of accept that, you know, the deal as it stands, imperfect as it is, is actually better than no deal and the uncertainty around Iran's nuclear program that could result. James Norton, when this does get kicked to Congress, what risks are posed there? You know, I actually think that uh, Congress, in this case, is probably going to want to work with the administration in terms of, uh, it seems like the recommendation is going to be to decertify but yet not move forward with sanctions. Certainly the White House, through the Treasury Department, has authority to issue sanctions if they want to, and, but I don't think at this point there's a momentum on the Hill to necessarily move through uh, sanctions. You know, Bob Corker, who's the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, was, you know, as President Trump mocked him for, but was actually, you know, part of the deal uh, several years ago, supports supports it and I don't haven't seen any signals to this point that they're going to move through um, you know additional sanctions and you know even if there was 
a congressional fix that was needed. I think that's another area for, where President Trump is, you know, finding himself in a little bit of trouble in terms of relationships, openly fighting with chairmen of committee, chairmen of his own party. And so um, whatever's announced today is going to have to be, you know, probably stand as is, at least for the time being, unless there's able to work out some sort of a, a deal behind the scenes longer term. But at this point, I don't necessarily see that uh, that happening. And obviously, you know, Theresa May, you know, weighing in with the president and, and wanting him to, you know, work with stability in the region was obviously, I think, an important point and something that hopefully he'll listen to some, uh, you know, some of the allies in terms of why this deal needs to have some of the tenants, uh, you know, remain, remain in place and have that open dialogue. Yeah, James Serene, if he does say what we expect him to say, what will the reaction be from the other signatories to this deal? Um, Britain, France, Germany, China, Russia? Mm. Well, I think that the European powers have been very clear that they wanted the deal to stay. They thought that the, uh, uh, the, the, the deal, you know, whatever its flaws, they thought it provided a guarantee of regional stability. But I think what's interesting about the European approach and also the UK approach is that they fear uh, the breakup of the deal uh, much more than they fear uh, Iranian aggression in the region and uh, Iran's ballistic missile program. And I think that's where some of this dividing line goes. And it's not clear uh, uh, what the UK and what Europe actually are going to do about Iranian aggression in the region, particularly their role in Syria. Um, I think for Russia, uh, this is perfect for them. I mean, can really ramp this up. You know, it looks like Trump is the one that's not sticking to international agreements. It looks like they're kind of complying with international order. Uh, same with China. But I think the, the issue with Russia is far more complex. Iran is a very close ally of Iran. Um, so it's really in Russia's interests uh, that, you know, the ball is put back in the U.S.'s court where it looks like, I don't know, Trump's unique genius here has almost been able to uh, create a situation where Iran is saying that the U.S. is violating and Iran is sticking to the deal. So, you know, for Russia, you know, that, 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 that's all good. It takes attention away from, you know, what Russia's doing in Syria with Iran. James Norton, would you agree with that? You know, I think from the standpoint of one thing that's important to note, one of the key tenets of uh, Trump's campaign was that he was very critical of intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan and and really basically said that he wouldn't have gone that way you know had he been president at the time and so I think that that it clearly is a signal to the region that he's not interested in necessarily any type of force or, or troops on the ground or any type of engagement uh, on that level so I think if that's already been been laid out by him you know earlier in the campaign and I think that's still true today despite you know a, a slight ramp up in Afghanistan uh, you know of a few thousand advisors uh, last month I think it does kind of say okay well it's gonna have to happen at the negotiating table or happen with you know working with allies he's obviously pushed NATO pretty hard uh, in terms of coming to the table and, and spending more money and resources and that kind of stuff so I think he's probably gonna still continue to go in that direction he's still gonna wanna um, you know, work out some sort of deal, um, you know, longer term, and that I, I would agree that this is some sort of negotiating tactic in terms of uh, Twitter diplomacy, if you will, putting out some certain messages, you know, kind of on the net and then, you know, working some things behind the scenes and then, you know, hopefully listening to some of his advisors. Okay, interesting. Expecting that speech in a few minutes' time, but uh, James Serene, James Norton, thanks very much for your time. Uh, there is the room, I think it's the diplomatic map room, I'm hearing, one of three oval rooms in the White House expecting President Trump to take to that podium. In a few minutes' time, you will see it live here on Sky News when he does.